7 p.m. will be a prayer meeting at the Elders. Most please let them know the plan to attend. Um, March 17th and 18th is the uh, Fellowship of Bible Church's winter retreat. Uh, seems uh, there are some flyers on the on the back table if uh, you'd like to take a look at them. April 1st, we're going to have a church cleaning day. Uh, many hands make light work, so please come out if you could and, and help us um, to clean up a little bit. Uh, April 7th is a Good Friday service at 7 p.m. Uh, with communion. And I believe Pastor Sam was going to speak for us that, that evening. Um, April 9th is the uh, Easter service and the festivities associated with that. And please save the date, uh, June 26th through the 30th is our BBS program this year. Um, and the next council meeting and the uh, mom bear uh, study uh, to be announced. Wait, I have the mom bear study, sorry, Tammy. Um, March 14th. March 14th. Does that work?
things there that were very good. I think mean, most of us in ourselves were really uh, singing along with the words. This now in prayer, we'll pray for Mike. You know, things like that sometimes is prevention. Uh, they were looking for something, but it's better to find it now than on. So God makes no mistakes. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we give thanks for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you. You're watching over us. We pray for Mike now and his shoulder and uh, this spot alone. It's good to get it looked at now, maybe prevent something in the future. We know we're in your hands. And you make no mistakes. We pray you bless your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Hebrews chapter 5 and 6. Looking at this passage of scripture, a slight problem I'm having with it is in chapter 5, verse 11, goes through all of chapter 6. You know, as fast as I talk, I can't get through all of it at one time. So what I want to do is just do a brief survey of 5, 11, through the end of chapter 6 to see how our sermon today fits in. <clears throat> in. In chapter 5, characteristics of spiritual immaturity. We should all be mature. We're going to see how can you tell when someone <clears throat> is not mature. Then chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the command for spiritual maturity. Our key verse is chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Let's grow up. Let's be adults about the Lord. That's my key thought there. And then in verse 3, confidence in the Lord. My problem is, too many of you have your Bibles open, and verse 3 is followed by verse 4, 5, 6, 7. One of the most controversial verses in the Bible. It is so bad that a lot of commentaries skip this altogether. So a person like me, well, they were fools, pure and trad. But I want to look at this section for just a little bit. And I've titled this, we're not going to look at this, no sermon's notes. This is the only time I'm going to do it. I'm looking at uh, Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, confusion that calls a spiritual maturity. When people are not walking with the Lord, a lot of confusion happens. That's physical maturity, that's spiritual maturity as well. So we'll look at these verses beginning in verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, and they should fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify it to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes down often upon it, brings forth herbs mean for use, by whom it is blessed, receiving blessing from God. But that which forms and mires is rejected. It is nigh of the cursing whose end is to be burned. So the question is, who is he talking about? What is all this? Today's sermon is more of a challenge. Next week will be more of a comfort. Today is a challenge. What are we going to do? But I can't wait until we get to verse 9. But beloved, I'm persuaded better things of you. So next week is more comfort. But there needs to be this challenge for us. So who are these people they're talking about? Well, there's four views that are prevalent. And I'll give those. And I wasn't satisfied, so I kind of worked on my own thought. It, talking here about if you fall away in verse 6, it's impossible to be like repentance. The first view is, this is talking about losing your salvation. That you can be saved, and something happens, and you lose your salvation. Now, I was taught that in our church, that you could lose your salvation. Uh, you do something, you could lose it. They never exactly explained what it was, probably murder, maybe rape, 
arson. I don't know how big the fire would be, but I don't take any chances on it. And we've even taught, if you're in the wrong place when the rapture took place, you'd be left behind. That scared the daylights out of me because in school, never disobedient, never rebellious, but mischief was not often far away. And I didn't want to be in mischief the rapture took place. I get on my school bus and come home and mom and dad are raptured and I've got 20 cows and a John Deere tractor and four horses to care by myself and be scared to death. <laughs> now that's not true. Because in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish. He says, you're in my hand and you will never perish and my hand is in the Father's hand. So we don't lose our salvation. It's true. We don't deserve to keep it. Did we deserve to get it? To start with. When were we that worthy of heaven? Never. So God saved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. If I was choosing people, I wouldn't choose the one that God saved. But God is love. And God loves us so much, he sent Christ to die on Calvary's cross. If we receive him as our Savior, we call upon his name, we have salvation. And he is the one saved. Next thing we're going to see that. I'm saved not because of Frizzleburg Bible Church guarantee. I'm saved because of God's guarantee. So that view is not correct. The second view is hypothetical. If a Christian could lose his salvation, he couldn't get it back. So there was a view for a while that God gives us salvation. If you lose it, it says back here in verse 4, it's impossible down there to bring to repentance. So you're saved once, God gives it to you. If you lose it, you're done. This was so prevalent, and I don't know who it was, but one of the kings was wicked. And the church wanted him to be saved, but they, they didn't lead him to the war to his deathbed. Figured by that time he couldn't do anything bad to, get, to lose his salvation. <laughs> the problem with that is this. Not all people have a deathbed experience. Some it's heart attack and they're gone. I mean, people say, well, I'm going to get saved at 11th hour but you might die at 1045. Mm -hmm. So don't put it off too long. We don't think that's the way it should be. Uh, and then there's also something here in verse 3. This we will do. And in verse 9, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. While in verse 4 it says, for it's impossible for those. So it's possible he's not talking about the Christians here but giving a hypothetical illustration. If you could lose your salvation, this is what would happen. That view, uh, I don't think, matches up to you. Another view is that this refers to people who heard about the gospel, but never actually accepted Christ as their Savior. They, they were in church. They did good works. Jesus even mentioned this in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, when enter the kingdom? They say to him, Lord, we cast out demons. We did things in your name. He will say, I never knew you. Hope it's not sacrilegious. I call these people Andy, Griff Andy Griffin Christians. Always a girlfriend, never getting married. <laughs> you get the point? <laughs> and it could be possible that people in church all their lives have never accepted Christ. They've coasted along with it. So my challenge to you today is that you accept Christ as your Savior. Now my wife is partly that true. She grew up in a church, a Bible church. She went so faithful, they thought she was a Christian before she actually received the Lord. So just because people come to church doesn't make them <coughs> I'm wondering if the devil can't keep you out of heaven. He'll get you so close to salvation but not quite there. So it's always a danger. I think it bothers me that people could appreciate my sermon, like my sermon, and never accept Jesus. Now, I'm sorry, but you get to get in heaven 
And the question is, why should I leave you in? And you said, I like Pastor Sam's sermons. That's not going to get you in. It's not that late. So I'm always concerned, do you have a relationship with Christ? If I ask you, are you married? They say, well, we hold hands. Hold hands and I get married. <laughs> There's got to be that relationship. So it could be these ones have come this close. God's worked in your heart, but never gotten seen. Another view, the fourth one is, this could be dealing with sin in a Christian's life, where they lose their reward. Now, all these things are true. Whether it fits here, I don't know. There are possibilities that people can live for the Lord and then do something stupid, something sinful, and lose their reward. In sports, Daytona 500, last year, Joe Gibbs team won. I didn't realize at Daytona 500. Number one car and number two car is taken to the garage and rechecked for specifications. And Joe Gibbs car had something on it illegal and disqualified. Can you imagine how much loss of money and all that? He was disqualified because something was wrong. So it's possible we can live with the Lord and then get in sin. I've known preachers that have done things that disqualified them for the ministry. 1 Corinthians 3.15 If a man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Yet he himself shall not be saved. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now you may think rewards are nothing. But rewards are important. God's given us for rewards for serving him. But we can cancel out. And our works burned up. All we've done. I've known a pastor that had big churches. The pastor runs off with a woman. And everything collapses. So that could happen. But all of these have a point, but I wasn't totally sure. So I guess it's my best time of thinking in the morning. I make my morning walk in Thurmont, 6.15 and 6.30 I start. I usually have this, the streets to myself. Just watch out for a few cars and I'm good to go. I can think there's got to be something more. So I begin to work on something. The book of Hebrews was written to who? Hebrews. Jews, Jewish Christians, written about 66 A.D. These older people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s had lived before Jesus. How did you worship before Jesus? You went to Jerusalem. You had a sacrifice. You did this. You did that. Now they're in the church. We don't do that. We know in Acts 15, there an issue came up. What he said, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised according to Moses. So the church had some believers who wanted to go back to the good old days before Jesus. So it would say here, if you're going to go back before Jesus, then he would say, you crucified the Son of Man again. So I was hesitant about that. Tell her what, wrote a, read a book by J. Vernon McGee, and he agrees with me, so that's the position. <laughs> the point is, I hate to preach something. I'm not totally sure what it is. But I know what verse 9 is. Beloved, we're persuaded of better things of you. So next week, we'll go there. Now we're going to go back and look at some of these characteristics of spiritual inventory on our chart here. Dullness is evident. Verse 11. Of 511, of which we have many things to say to you, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Those of you that teach, you ever think they're students? Man, they are dull. <laughs> they don't get it. When I was in Bible college, uh, they were patient and would go with it. In seminary, uh, my role eyes, teacher would say, you graduate worship Bible college, you know this, and on they go. And I don't <coughs> know it. In my case, it was 12 years between year one in seminary and year two. And my Greek was worse than my piano playing. 
So I was in trouble. But uh, the teachers wondered, why don't you get that? And then they would say, well, Homer Heater gets it. He later became the president of the school. And I'm trying to get out of here alive. So it could be dullness. It says hard to be uttered means hard to put into words. <clears throat> Again, in, in college and seminary, teacher would explain something. And then when they explained it, they would say, how many of you understand what I've said? Put our hands up. Say, so-and-so, explain it. Well, uh, I'm trying to put it into words. I can't quite put the words. You don't know it. You go through it again until you can explain it. Can we explain salvation? At least lead people to the Lord. These ones were dull of hearing. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receives not the things of God. They are forced to him. He can now know them because they are spiritually discerned. Have you ever seen the Lord work in your life that to you it is obvious? It is clear. Like when, when my God, I don't know what will happen with that x-ray. But was it, that's an answer to prayer. And somebody else says, I was a lucky break. Wait well, I don't have luck like that. I have a Lord. Not a lot, but the world looks at it as like you believe in pie, pie in the sky by and by. Nobody have a citizenship there. And they all understand. Jack and I discuss frequently about our neighbors. They see us every morning. Get up, come out. We're excited. We're jubilant. We're glad to go to church and early. <laughs> they don't understand. They don't know. Spiritual immaturity, dullness is evident. Then in verse 12, 13, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which for the first principles of the oracles of God have become those that have need of milk and not of strong meat. When you should be teachers, you're still in kindergarten. I'm sure all those with freedom of Christian school and John and Hank here, the best way to learn the Bible is teach it. Because if you're not on the target, your students will help you. <laughs> They'll raise their hand and say, hey, teacher, how about thus and so? That happened in Bible college, and Mr. Bishop would always say, let me check that out. I thought, what a humble man. He wasn't humble. He didn't know. I don't know. But it, it helps us learn to teach the Bible. Now, many of you would say, well, I feel nervous about your teaching. If you have children, you are a teacher. You're teaching your children. You may not be a PhD at Daniel College, Donald College, but you're, a, you're a teacher. I, growing up, my mother read Bible stories. And my father explained Bible stories. I didn't realize they were teachers. So all of us are teachers to someone else, teaching children about the Word of God. We ought to be teachers. We're still in kindergarten. <clears throat> it says you have those that have need of milk and not of strong meat. Then verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. In the Bible, there's different words for, for baby. The word that we use here, for interesting, it's a non-speaking baby. It's a baby that hasn't learned to talk yet. When your children are little, what are you interested in? Say mama. Say dad, dad. And you can't wait. Oh, they said the word. So, you learn the children to learn to talk and walk. You know why kids are frustrated? We teach them to talk and walk. And then we say, sit down and shut up. <laughs> the poor kids are, they don't know what to do. We have a six-year-old great-granddaughter, two four-year-olds, and we have three that will be two years old this year. Juliet will be two next month. 
Julia is now at that age, that's Christy's youngest. She's going to be two next month. She's old enough now to repeat what you say. Say mama. She says mama. Dada. Dada. Mimi. That's Beth. She says Mimi. Pop pop. That's Mark. Gabby. Pop. Light. And so we went over recently and she was in this thing repeating everything you say. Oh, try something. I said, Julia, say, no way, Jose. <laughs> and she said it. <laughs> now, the Lord can certainly, sometime her father, Jacob, is going to say something and she's going to say to her, her daddy, no way, Jose. <laughs> He's going to say what? Who taught you that? <laughs> Pop did. I was tempted. Since I'm on a roll, but I thought, better not do it. They are rabid Penn State Netley Line fans. <laughs> I'm from Maryland. I came very close to say, Julian, say, Maryland Terrapins. <laughs> but I thought, I'm in enough trouble right now. But that's a baby. No, but the context here is what can't even talk yet. So that certainly is immaturity. Then in verse 14. But strong meat belongs to those who are of full age, that is, they've grown up. Even those who, by reason of their senses, are exercised to discern both between good and evil, determine what is right and what is wrong. It's been amazing over the years the things that, that people just are not spiritually discerning. I had a lady in a church one time that was nominal. Was he? Did say it wrong about it, nothing fancy about it. She called me one day and said, I have a group that's been meeting in my home for a Bible study. Oh, hold my breath. Jehovah's Witness. All she knew is they were going wrong, but she didn't know how to get out. But why let them in? And so Christians sometimes are not deserving. What is going on in our world? What's going on with theology? So discerning is missing <clears throat> in verse 14. That brings us to chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, reject doubts about Christ's work on the cross. Not that we believe about it, but do you believe that Jesus paid it all? You believe when he said, it is finished? It is finished? If Jesus said he paid it all, how much do you still owe? You see? And we can spend all our time back on that foundation, not focusing on that entirely, not forgetting it. <clears throat> so here's a group that are always thinking about the, going back to Christ's work on Calvary's cross. And then it says, Resolve to go for it. Let us go on unto perfection or maturity. Let's grow up. Let's do things that are moving us ahead. There should be a desire all of us to know the Bible better. What's the first step in knowing the Bible better? Read the book. My wife and I are reading the Bible right now. We're just finished Deuteronomy today. And Going back through some things in the Old Testament, sometimes I look at the front, is this the same Bible? I've missed this the past time. <laughs> or, it's so interesting to read something in the Bible that looks just like what's happening here. So we learn the Bible more and more. Read it. Study it. Ask the Lord to show you what these things are. Let us go on. That's not the best translation. Because that means, I'm going to go forward. Actually, it means be carried to maturity. It means let God mature you. We can't mature ourselves. It is God <coughs> who leads us forward. Then it says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Recognize, but don't limit yourself to basic fundamentals. My wife's home church when I was pastoring there, 
there was a man in there that his wife attended. He didn't come that much, hardly ever. But his wife came. So I was talking to him one time about his relationship to the Lord. That fellow had as clear a testimony of knowing the Lord, the church, the day, the whole thing's about it. And nothing else. Had no desire to read the Bible. No desire to pray. No desire to go to church. And I'm just thinking, I don't think God has stillbirths. How could a person say, I'm born again and never have any interest in God whatsoever? All he was, just basic. Laying the foundation. Now we do need a foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11 Other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But we don't spend all our time on the foundation. Now, I did something this morning that I've never done before I came here. I checked the bottom of the church building a little closer, just for my sermon illustration. But I didn't try to go in that little side door here. Now, what would, you, what would Wes think if he saw me going this, this morning, checking to see if the foundation of this church is, is going to hold up? Did you ever go to church just to see the foundation? Wouldn't you grow up and want to come in the auditorium? There's some people just basic only. They never mature, never grow up. They're just thinking about the foundation. Repentance is negative. You repent what you've done. Faith toward God. I thank the Lord for the day I was saved. But I don't spend all my time on that day. I was born in Frank Memorial Hospital. I've gone into the hospital a couple of times. Emergency room. They've never taken me to the delivery room. There are people that just simply have never matured, never grown up in the Lord. And the reason why I'm saying this is in China, when the communists came into China in the 1940s, First thing you did, expelled all American missionaries because they're imperialists. That meant in one week, all missionaries go on next Sunday, no missionaries. But they had church. Guess what they did? Took out all the elders the next week. Put them outside. Whoever they were, don't mind. What happened next week? Deacons led the search. What did a good government do? Took out all the deacons. See where I'm going? They take it out, take it back out, take it out, take it out. But Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So the people in China, the Christians in China, held Bible studies in their homes, and all these years later, still there. Understand what's happening in Iran, the great revival in Iran, behind the scenes, because the layman. The individuals are growing in Christ. And I appreciate you being here, but the strength of this church are the individuals. I don't want to be the only strong one. Maybe selfish. If I'm the only strong one, the devil's only got one target. I'd like for him to have a lot more targets than he can shoot me all the time. Maybe that's selfish. You see, we're all in this, we're all in this together. And I'm watching what's happening in Canada. Can't believe some of the things in China. Remember last year when they had that truck convoy? A pastor was arrested because he went to the convoy and just prayed with them. So what's happening across America and around the world? There are people that hate churches. They, even, they hate the fellowship of Bible churches. They hate Bible preaching churches. They not only want to keep the Bible out of schools, they want to keep the Bible out of churches. And I think, I think COVID was a trial run to see how it might go. Now, they didn't tell us we couldn't preach the Bible. So we're, we're good to go there. But we're going to have to obey God, not man. And so we need to go beyond these laying the foundation and so forth. And then it talks about doctrines of baptisms and laying on of hands. That's experiences after conversion. We move beyond that. I'm glad what the Lord has done 
in the past. I'm looking forward to the Lord in the future. Look at our, our annual retreats with fellowship Bible churches. We have great retreats. But you think this year we ought to just go back and just review it how we've done in the past. One of the things, right, one of the speakers is going to deal with how to deal with Muslims. You think that's an important issue? So we're going forward. We're, we're growing in the Lord. Then it says, future events, life, a resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. I've known some people that had notebooks on Bible prophecy. They know every trumpet in Revelation, every vial, every boil, every seal, but they're not worth five cents in the local church. They didn't know what preachers believe on this, what they believe on that. I believe Jesus is coming, but it should affect our lives today. We should live today like Jesus could come today. And then verse 3, it says, and this we will do. We're going to go on if God will. Now, in the rich language, it would say like this. This we will do if God will permit, and he will. It's been interesting to me over the years, and I guess this week, well, when I'm, I like to go verse by verse. It makes it easier for me. I know my outline to follow what the Bible says. The difficulty is, you hit a few of these road bumps, and all last week I'm the Lord, what am I going to say on Sunday? Because I'm afraid some of you, if I said I'm going to end on verse 3, next week start verse 9, somebody might, be hey, preacher, what about verses 4 through 7? What am I going to say? And there have been times with me where I'm going on, like, how to be more than conquer? How can you be more than conquer? Well, you win everything. But there are times I'm going especially teaching in the fellowship of Bible churches in their Bible Institute with these kids that are sharp and here I'm an old timer and I'm trotting along and they're going to raise their hand. I'll use Mr. Bishop. Let me write that down and get back to you. And I know well enough next week if I forgot they're going to say, hey, preacher, what was the answer? So you may be like that. Your kids ask you questions. You ever have parents? Kids, kids ask you a question. And what gets you in trouble is this. You get this, and they say, why is that? And you get by, I see Justin's mouth. And why is this? They keep backing you into a corner and not watching it. But it's good for us. It's good for us to let the children ask us questions and go further along in the things of the Lord. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it on the day of Jesus Christ. I can't believe, being in the ministry 60 years, how much I don't know about the Bible. Can you believe when I went to Washington Bible College, I said, I'm, my purpose is going to Washington Bible College, I'm going to learn the Bible in four years. <laughs> and then in four years, I know everything. Halfway through my senior year, I thought, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> and here I am today. I haven't made it. But I'll tell you this we're closer than we have been. We're making progress. And I can tell you folks, know your Bible is a lot better than you might think you know. And God will help you. Our desire is to mature, to serve the Lord, admit when we don't know something, and do what God would have us do. And next week, God has better things for us. And we're going to find out God always keeps this promise. And he's promised to help us. And do we ever need help? Let's not pray. Father, we need your help in our church here, in our country. We thank you that you're the one that will help us. You're the one that will lead us, that will direct us. We don't want to go astray. We don't want to go back. We want to go on. Help us to walk in a mature way to glorify you. We pray in Christ's name.
include with VIN number 113. And uh, in case you didn't quite absorb everything on the first class there, uh, your salvation is secure. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Uh, we need to grow up. <laughs> There's a lot more to, to search out. And my take on those difficult verses, I've struggled with them for a long time too, is that uh, once you are saved, you can't revert back to being unsaved and have to then crucify Christ again and you repent it. The work was done. So we need to just recognize he did the work. No matter how much we go about messing ourselves up again. And as Christians, we can really mess things up. I think Christians can make other Christians most miserable. <laughs> you don't expect much out of an unbeliever. But you expect a lot out of your fellow believer. And believers can let that dead uh, old self have an awful lot of power. But you, uh, you can't go back and you don't need to go back and be saved again. He saved you. You have the power to resurrection. So let's grow up. So let's uh, stand and sing. Uh, what a joy to live for Jesus.